Hey everyone, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And in this video, we're going to discuss electron domains, VSEPR theory, and how they can lead us to determine a molecule's geometry, which is a critical property for predicting how chemicals will behave and interact with one another. Let's get started. We'll begin by discussing electron domains. Now, an electron domain is most simply defined as a concerted group of electrons that occupies the same general space around a central atom. Let's take an example like ozone and focus in on that central oxygen atom. Here, ozone has a lone pair on its central atom. This would be a concerted group of electrons that occupy that orbital that the lone pair is in. So this would qualify as an electron domain. Bonding electrons also can form domains. For example, single bonds like this bond here on the left side of my central atom constitute an electron domain because even though they're being shared with another atom, they're confined to a certain region of space around the central oxygen. And in the case of multiple bonds, they can also be formed as electron domains. In this case, I have a double bond in which all four of the electrons involved in that double bond are confined within the same general region of space around the central atom. So even though there are twice as many electrons in that double bond, it still only counts as one electron domain. So in this case, my central oxygen atom having a single bond, a double bond, and a lone pair of electrons would have three different electron domains around it. In the future, I'll be referring to the electron domains around a central atom using a simple system of uh, nomenclature in which the central atom is an A. Any electron domains that involve bonding electrons are shown as an X and lone pair electron domains are shown using an E. Using this notation, I can create a generic formula. For example, in the central atom of ozone, I would refer to that as an AX2E1 compound. I'll be using this as we move forward and begin exploring how electron domains and their behavior affect molecular geometries. Before we can begin determining molecular geometries, we still need to discuss VSEPR theory, or valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, which is really just a fancy way of stating that electron domains like their space. Because they contain groups of negatively charged electrons, electron domains naturally repel one another and therefore seek out a location around the central atom that gives them as much space as possible. Let's look at an example. Here's an AX3E0 compound with our central atom A having three electron domains. But right now those aren't happy domains because they could be farther apart. Notice in particular that these two domains are only about 90 degrees apart from one another. So this geometry has not been optimized. If I instead allow this molecule to find its lowest energy state, what I discover is those electron domains space themselves out to form angles of 120 degrees between and among all of them. Taking on these angles leads to a compound that has a triangular shape among the domains and the central atom is directly inside of the plane defined by that triangle. Therefore, we call this geometry trigonal planar. In this example, we've seen how bonding electron domains press against one another to cause themselves to spread out. And lone pairs do exactly the same, but they're even worse. Lone pair electrons want their space even more. So when there are choices between bonding and lone pair electron domains, we have to be sure we always give our lone pairs preference in giving them the most space possible. Let's take a look at how all this plays out to help us determine molecular geometries. We'll start with a very simple geometry, one in which there are two electron domains. These two electron domains, of course, will spread themselves out as far as possible, creating a 180 degree angle between them. So we call this domain geometry linear. If both of those domains are bonding domains, then we have all three atoms, again, in a straight line. So our AX2E0 compound will have a molecular geometry that's the same as the domain geometry, linear. 
An example of this is carbon dioxide, in which the central carbon atom has two electron domains, each of which are participating in bonding to an oxygen atom. Now if we go up to three electron domains, we see that trigonal planar domain geometry that we discussed previously. In this case, we have 120 degree angles between all of the electron domains. So the shape of a molecule that had an AX3E0 formula, for example, is again expected to be exactly the same as the domain geometry, trigonal planar. An example of a trigonal planar compound is boron trifluoride, in which the boron has three bonding electron domains, each to a fluorine atom. But now there's another possibility. Imagine that instead of having all bonding domains, we had one lone pair. In such a situation, the lone pair still pushes against the other domains and causes our molecule to adopt this type of geometry. However, in the case of molecular geometries, we want to leave the influence but remove the appearance of that lone pair of electrons since there's no atom on the other side. In other words, if we look at an AX2E1 compound, we first determine its domain geometry is in fact trigonal planar, but then we remove the appearance but not the influence of the lone pair. And in doing so, we find that those three atoms are not in a line. This molecule is what we call bent. Specifically, it's bent with an angle of about 120 degrees among those three atoms. An example of this type of molecule is the ozone molecule that we looked at previously, in which the central oxygen atom has two bonding electron domains and one lone pair. As we move on to having four electron domains, now we have to move into the third dimension to get our domains as far apart as possible assuming a geometry that's called tetrahedral, because connecting all of the domains together by lines results in the formation of a tetrahedron. In this case, all of the angles between and among the domains are 109.5 degrees. So let's imagine that we have a compound with a domain geometry that is dictated by four electron domains, and all of those domains are bonding. Now we're dealing with an AX4E0 formula. And again, the molecular geometry is exactly the same as the domain geometry because all of the domains are bonding. This is a tetrahedral molecule, an example of which would be the compound methane, where the central carbon has four bonding electron domains, each to a hydrogen. But just as we did previously, we now have to consider the possibility that there are lone pair electrons around the central atom. What if instead we have a molecule that has a formula AX3E1. In this case, the lone pair electrons, again, are still pushing down on those bonding electron domains. However, when we determine the molecular geometry, we leave its influence, but we remove its appearance from the molecule. And in doing so, we have a triangular shaped molecule as far as the orientation of the domains that are bonding, but notice that the central atom is up above the plane of the triangle that it creates. So we call this a trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry. An example of a trigonal pyramidal molecule is ammonia, in which the nitrogen in the center has three bonding electron domains, but also one lone pair, which pushes those other uh, NH bonds down and out of the plane of the molecule. Similarly, we can go on. Let's imagine that we have an AX2E2 molecule. Now we have two lone pairs and only two bonding domains. And if I leave the influence but remove the appearance of my lone pairs, I find that I have a molecule that's bent. But this time, it's bent at about 109.5 degrees. An example of a molecule like this is water, H2O, in which the central oxygen has two bonding domains to hydrogens and two lone pairs as well. When we reach five electron domains, something interesting happens. We get a geometry in which we have two distinct locations around the central atom. We call this geometry trigonal bipyramidal because connecting the dots gives us an object that looks a bit like two pyramids with triangular bases have been stacked base to base. Now in creating this, we see that we actually create two different potential bond angles. There's a 90 degree angle here between these two domains, 
But if we look at a different orientation, we can see there's another set of domains that actually have an angle of 120 degrees. This means that there are two distinct locations within this five electron domain compound. We call those pointing straight up and down here in my top image uh, axial, and we call the others equatorial, highlighted in orange. Notice that the axial position has three different domains 90 degrees from it, whereas the equatorial positions only have two. This will become very important as we start to populate this domain geometry to try to figure out molecular geometries. Let's begin as we usually do by having one that only has bonding electron domains. In this case, we'd be dealing with an AX5E0 compound. In this case, as usual, the molecular geometry is the same as the domain geometry, trigonal bipyramidal. An example of which is this phosphorus pentafluoride compound in which the phosphorus in the center has five bonding electron domains. Remember, phosphorus can have an expanded octet because it hails from the third row of the periodic table. Now let's think about another molecule, one in which we have an AX4E1 formula. In this case, we have a lone pair, so we have to choose where to put it. Does it go in an axial position or does it go in an equatorial position? As you can see here, I placed it in an equatorial position so that it's only 90 degrees away from two neighbors, not three. The consequence of this is that when I remove the appearance, but not the influence of that lone pair, I get a compound that looks a bit like a seesaw. An example of a compound with a seesaw geometry is sulfur tetrafluoride, in which the central sulfur atom has four bonding domains and one lone pair. Let's carry that forward one more step. Let's imagine we have a compound that has an AX3E2 formula. In this case, again, I have to remember to place my lone pair electrons into equatorial positions because in these positions, they'll be as far apart as possible from as many domains as possible within this compound. And again, removing the appearance but not the influence of those lone pair electrons gives me a structure that looks a bit like the letter T. Hence, we call this a T-shaped molecular geometry. And a T-shaped molecule for example, is this interhalogen compound, chlorine trifluoride, in which the central chlorine atom has three bonding domains and two lone pairs, causing it to adopt this T-shape. Finally, let's consider a few possibilities in which there are six electron domains. When there are six electron domains around a central atom, it adopts a geometry that we call octahedral. Now that may seem a little bit odd. Why would we use the term octahedral for six electron domains? Doesn't octa in invoke the number eight? In fact, it does. And connecting all of the domains together with lines leads to an octagon, which is how this compound or this geometry got its name. You'll notice that within this octahedral geometry, all of the domains are 90 degrees from one another. So there are no preferred positions at this point. Now imagine that we have a compound that has all six of those electron domains involved in bonding. That would be an AX6E0 compound. And as always, the molecular geometry when they're all bonding domains is the same as the domain geometry, octahedral. An example of this compound, sulfur hexafluoride, in which the central sulfur atom has six domains, all of which are bonding to a fluorine atom. When we place our first lone pair into this particular compound, we can put it anywhere because all positions are identical. I placed it down here on the bottom to create my AX5E1 compound. And if, as usual, I remove the appearance but not the influence of my lone pair, I get what traces out to be a pyramid with a square-shaped base. And so we call this geometry square pyramidal. An example of a square pyramidal compound is bromine pentafluoride, shown here with its five bonding electron domains and one lone pair. And finally, let's consider what happens when we have two lone pairs. 
Now adding the second lone pair, I need to be more careful because remember, lone pairs like their space even more than bonding pairs do. So putting two lone pairs adjacent to one another in this case wouldn't be the right thing to do. Instead, I place them at opposition to one another. So they're on completely opposite sides of my molecule. So this AX4E2 compound has two lone pairs at opposing sides. And when I remove their appearance, but not their influence, I get a compound that traces out a square. And sure enough, right in the center of that square in the same plane as all of the other atoms is my central atom. So we call this square planar. An example of a square planar compound is xenon tetrafluoride, wherein the xenon has four bonding electron domains and two lone pairs. This concludes our discussion on electron domains and how we can determine molecular geometries using them. I hope it was informative and I hope I'll see you again on my next video. Until then, I'm Professor Davis from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. As always, see you next time.